So hello everyone, uh, my name is Laz, I'm a Medical Education Fellow at the University of Nottingham. Um, just as a quick introduction um, of who I am, um, I currently work for the assessments team at the university, so I help write the knowledge papers and the OSCEs for our clinical based students. And um, I'm also on the committee for TASME as the awards representative. Um, I'm going to be sort of uh, trying to pay attention and ask all the difficult questions to uh, Abby and Elliot and possibly Alan as well later on. Um, while Ryan is keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so just uh, so we get to know everyone a little bit better. Um, Ryan, could you tell us a little bit more about who you are? Hi, um, I'm Ryan. I'm a medical student at the University of Edinburgh and I'm the uh, one of the co-chairs of JASME, which is the junior branch of ASME that covers medical students to FY2s. Um, I've been involved with medical education since my first year at university, so uh, for a few years now. And what about you, Abby? Hi, my name's Abby. I'm a second year graduate entry medical student at the University of Warwick. I have a background in neuroscience and I am the JASME, one of the JASME media guys. Um, so I'm quite new, but hoping to go fast. Excellent, thank you. And what about you, Elliot? Hi, uh, I'm Elliot. I'm a GP trainee uh, in London and a lecturer in medical education at Keele University. Excellent. And have we got Alan Dennison joining us as well? Hello. Hi, yeah. um, so um, um, my name's Alan Dennison. Um, I'm a background in radiology. I got into medical education as a clinical teaching fellow, so it's great to see some of you as your clinical teaching fellows. Although I was interested as a medical student, so great to see you here, medical students involved as well. Once I finished my clinical teaching fellowship, I became a senior lecturer in medical education and radiology up in Aberdeen. Uh, ended up being the teaching dean for undergraduate medicine and then uh, changed tack a little bit last year. And now I'm the postgraduate dean up in Scotland. And uh, I just think it's great you're doing this. Medical education is a wonderful really exciting career, um, lots of opportunity, lots of inspiration. It's a really creative space. And so hooray for medical education. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan. Yeah, one of the main reasons we wanted to do this sort of session was just to get uh, sort of different perspectives on uh, how people have gotten into medical education, see what uh, their opinions are and their experiences, um, just to give everyone else a bit of a flavour for um, what medical education is like as a almost specialty I suppose. Um, Abby how did you actually first start getting involved because I didn't I as a medical student I didn't even think that medical education <laughs> existed. Um, I think it comes from being an old student so when you're on your fifth lecture of the day you do start wondering if you could have maybe changed the way it happened. Um, so it, it kind of started to kick in at the end of first year into second year and I began to realise that I really do love teaching. Um, at Warwick we're quite pronounced in our peer-to-peer -peer education programmes and I taught a few kind of anatomy physiology days and realised that I absolutely loved it so I'm trying to steer my career path in that sort of direction at the moment and just completed my first research on it. So. Excellent, very, very yeah. good. And uh, how did you first start getting involved with ASME? Um, so there's, there's a bit of a funny story behind this. I did originally want to go for an ASME position, but totally forgot the deadline was coming up. And then I found out about ASME and actually thought it'd be a bit of a better suit for me. I really love social media. I think it's got a lot of potential. And I went for a social media role and uh, lucky enough to get on. Excellent. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, Elliot, you've been in the field for far, far longer. Did you also start as a medical student or? Yeah, so I started as a medical student um, probably in second or third year thinking about it um, and started with, a, started with an SSC in medical education and then um, the university I went to uh, were keen to try and get students to the ASME conference each year. So they funded uh, four students to go down 
um, or whatever it was, um, to the conference this year. So I applied for that and went along to my first ASME conference in 2012 um, and sort of haven't been able to stay away since. <laughs> Excellent. And um, do you work full time as a medical educationalist now? So, no, not at the moment. Um, so I've just started GP training in August. Um, so at the moment I do that and then I work a day and a half a week um, as a lecturer at Keele. Um, so that's, yeah, it's nice to be able to continue some education role. Um, and I'm just writing up my PhD in medical education as well. Um, so before August I was, yeah, full time um, doing a PhD uh, and lecturing. Oh, that's that sounds very intense. How did you uh, tell us about like an average, average day as a full time medical educationalist? Um, so an average day, where it yeah, I guess the thing is there's no average day. Um, or certainly I, I tended not to have an, an average day. Um, I would try and I try and start the morning with um, particularly if I was doing research at the time. So you know when I was doing my PhD and previous research try and start with a couple of hours of writing because um, I tend to find if I don't get, just get up and start with that then I'll, I'll never get around to it later in the day um, and then often would have um, you know if I'm teaching in the day um, we we'll do some of that or have quite a lot of marking to do so I tend to do that in the afternoon or peer reviewing papers uh, meetings um, yeah it's this I think that's one of the it's one of the beauties and one of the challenges of medical education is that you know it's medical education isn't one thing there's lots of different things you can get involved in within it um and they're all fun and sometimes it's challenging to learn which to prioritize and and which to try and say i haven't i haven't got capacity for this at the moment absolutely and um alan what about you as a postgraduate dean is there such a thing as an average day uh, no, th th there isn't. And uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, Elliot that th there's such a great diversity of things that you can do. Um, um, uh, and I was just thinking what I've been doing like today. I've been involved with the GMC uh, with a, a, a trainee in difficulty. I've chaired an awards panel for, for something that I, uh, I, I organize. I've written a position paper for changing specialty training in the diagnostics. Um, I've met the Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellows or some of them today. Uh, and I've also been in touch with a, a student that I have um, a mentorship role, a medical student. Um, so I, I think one of the things that strikes me is that there's, um, there's lots of different career pathways within education. You can absolutely have the, the PhD in medical education. And uh, um, I don't have a PhD in medical education, um, uh, but, but I did um, get, get my chair through various other scholarship routes and, and things that, that I've done. So uh, I, I it's unpredictable but to, for me I also really value my, my clinical work as well so I guess my one bit of advice is that if you can hang on to your clinical work and make it a central part of what it means to be an educator then I think that's really important because that grounds you and it makes sure that, that the education that you deliver and the research that you under, undertake is grounded in um, authenticity and research that, that actually matters. Okay. And it's great fun, great fun. <laughs> I think we all agree with you, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, links, linked to um, the discussion on PhDs, um, someone's asked, what was your PhD thesis centred around, Elliot? Um, so my PhD thesis was on, well, it still is on, I'm still trying to finish it, um, was looking at uh, how applicants from different backgrounds choose which medical schools to apply to. Um, so it's looking at um, widening access and medical school choice. Excellent. That's very interesting. Um, how did you actually pick that topic while we're while we're on that subject? Um, so I wanted to do a PhD. So since I, I did an integrated master's while uh, in medical education while I was at uh, med school, and sort of from month two of that realised that I wanted to do a PhD afterwards. Um, so I wanted to do one for a little while, and um, but I thought obviously have to progress other things first. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that after foundation training um, and I'd done some previous research uh, around admissions and selection. And I, I just saw this advertised on Twitter 
um, and it was funded, which I think is sometimes more challenging for political education PhDs than clinical PhDs. Um, and I thought it was important and uh, I looked at the supervisors and thought that they seemed reasonable. One of them I had met um, and chatted to at a conference in Vancouver a few years before and she seemed nice. So um, yeah, I just thought, well, I'll go for it and never looked back. Excellent. Uh, one of the questions we had come through um, the application uh, for this actual session was, um, do you think that doing academic research actually boosts your skills uh, like teaching or is it just something else that you're going to put on your CV and forget about? Um, it's difficult. I think, I don't think, you know, knowing all the research behind it necessarily makes you, um, you know, definitely a better teacher. I think it can help to understand some of the educational theory. Um, I think in terms of, it depends how you define being a teacher. Um, when you fit, or when I first started getting involved in medical education, you know, I was doing lots of face-to-face -face teaching, lots of small group teaching, stuff like that. And as time has got on, more of my role is around um, assessment and designing um, you know, teaching uh, programs and modules. And so I think it's definitely useful for the design side of things. Uh, and it is useful. Um, you don't necessarily have to do your own research to make it good, but being familiar with the research that's out there, I think is useful. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's essential, but I mean, the reason, you know, I, the reason I got involved in medical education research was because I enjoyed the teaching and I found some of the questions interesting, you know, why, like, so when I was looking at um, selection and admissions, I, I just found that I was curious about that. Um, yeah. And um, I think a lot of us are currently in the position of uh, either have already gotten stuck into some form of postgraduate medical um, education qualification or are thinking about it. Um, Alan, it, it was absolutely great to hear that, you know, you don't have to have a PhD to uh, manage to get a job uh, within medical education. Um, but how, how important do you think having some sort of a medical education uh, qualification is, even if it's just something like a PG cert? I, I think it's really important to have some um, external validation of your skills uh, for, for lots of reasons. But, but partly it's if you do something like a certificate or the or a diploma it compels you to look at stuff in, in medical education both that you're interested in but also things that are perhaps outside your comfort zone so my own experience was i wasn't really that interested to be honest in assessment until i did um, um uh, the, the diploma level and then i thought actually it is really interesting so then i got into uh, into the psychometrics and that and that side of things i also think it gives you that um, that, that confidence to use the language when you're talking about education, it gives you that underpinning of uh, the research methodology. Um, and uh, one of the duties of an educator, I think, is to make things better. And if you don't have that rigorous underpinning, whether it's at a, a certificate, diploma, master's, PhD level, then it's very difficult to make a meaningful change. If you're interested in uh, ultimately in a career as a, as a clinical academic in a medical education role, then I think these uh, letters after your name do matter. Um, we've spoken about the certificates and diplomas, but also don't forget other ways of having recognition, uh, such as from the Higher Education Academy um, uh, or um, AOMI, um, Academy of Medical Educators. There's lots of different routes of um, of, of getting recognition and to widen uh, both your own personal knowledge but also your networks of people as mm -hmm. well and we've heard uh, already how important um, supporters are in terms of um, giving you that that that, um, that encouragement and, and that environment in which to to be creative and to explore the possibilities thanks thank you um uh, Abby, as a as a medical student who's currently working towards your medical degree, is it disheartening to hear that you're going to have to do <laughs> another qualification after you're done? Fifty-fifty. Um, <laughs> I think so. I haven't intercalated. I have a separate degree, so okay. at the end of this, I will have clocked up seven years already. 
Um, but it is, it is actually something I've been thinking about for ECRE, um, despite the fact I'm only second year. Um, so it, it's kind of nice to know that actually I'm kind of thinking along a good path. Um, but yeah. <laughs> But, but but maybe if I can just come in and say it, it's not a race and you don't have to do things too, uh, too fast. Mm -hmm. So I know many people get into medical education uh, once they're a bit further uh, developed uh, uh, clinically. Um, so I was quite well into my postgraduate career before I, I really got interested in it. So just because you don't have um, all these letters after me, it doesn't mean to say that, that you, there isn't a space and a place for you uh, to be a really... Uh, authentic, compassionate, and uh, and uh, uh, valued a medical educator. Uh, I think when the time is right, that then it'll be right for you. And I never set out in my career, um, uh, and uh, doing the job that I'm currently doing. Um, uh, but it's about uh, making these changes and anticipating what's going to be helpful for you, and having these people around you that, that can support you. I think it's going to be helpful. So, um, um, but just enjoy the, the ride. That's that's what I'd say. With looking at the type of master's degrees you can do, is there any sort of, I don't know, preference or anything comparing part-time to full-time? You know, there's quite a few part-time master's degrees out there in medical education. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think if something is important to you, then you will make time for it. And mm -hmm. I know some people manage to uh, do a part-time master's uh, and a clinical job at the same time other people really struggle with that um, I think the important thing is to uh, be is to look at the um, uh, the university that's going to be offering that and to look at the support that you'll have for that and the caliber of the people that will be supervising the the, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the thesis part of your master's okay. so but people do lots of uh, degrees part-time and there's no reason why uh, people can't do that uh, but it's about making sure that you are in the right place professionally for it. Because at the same time as you might be doing a master's, you might also have other assessments you might have to sit. So for, for example, postgraduate uh, qualifications, membership uh, examinations. So um, you have to make sure you're not overloaded with um, assessments because um, otherwise you won't get the full value of doing the uh, master's or diploma or whatever, or whatever. Okay, thank you. Just to follow up from that, um, almost, uh, other than people that do it as an integrated degree, almost everyone does masters in medical education part time. Um, and one really good opportunity is so uh, lots of people do something like a teaching fellowship or clinical teaching fellowship um, at some point in their sort of postgraduate career. Um, people that are interested in sort of getting a, a first taste of working in medical education. And often uh, most universities that have those posts would fund something like a postgraduate certificate. Um, and you know it's it's really good to to do the postgrad certificate or, or you know up to the masters when you have the opportunity and time to put what you're learning into practice yeah otherwise it can seem a little bit theoretical and you know it's hard to really understand it when you're not getting to apply that much like it is you know when you're learning medicine mm -hmm. because a lot of people do masters and pg certs is there an absolute need to do a master's um, in order to have a career in med ed? I mean, it depends what, what sort of career you want. Um, I think most people that what, you know, would have, that are gonna have a substantive role in medical education, you know, where it's at least two or three days of their week would, would be likely to do a postgraduate certificate at some point. Um, but you know, it's, it's not essential. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I mean it's, it's simplifying things to overly, but it's yeah, well, at one end of medical education, you've got a pure theory driven medical educationalists who um, are, perhaps are not clinically active. And that's OK, because uh, the discipline needs people who are very much focused on that end. And at the other end, um, you've got people who um, uh, are far more involved in the teaching scholarship side rather than their research heavy medical education. And then there's a whole range of, of uh, roles in between. Um, and some people like doing medical education just on a, on a sessional basis and other people it'll become a, a dominant part of their career. So 
my view has always been it has uh, when the time is right for people then they can um, achieve whatever they feel that they want to and the metric of success should not be a, a professor of this uh, or, or, or that it's a what wherever you as an individual are going to be the most impact and have a bit of fun and um, and make also make sure that the education that you deliver is meaningful and will help um, the people coming uh, alongside and after you. Excellent. Um, I think everyone sort of touched on the point already, but it almost seems like um, medical education training is something you have to almost do in parallel to clinical training. And um, it's sometimes difficult juggling the two and knowing exactly when is the best time for you to sort of try and do more educational, uh, more uh, educational stuff and less clinical stuff. Um, Elliot, what have your sort of experiences been in sort of making the, not, not making the jump, but sort of transitioning to doing more um, medical education and less clinical uh, work? Um, good and bad. Uh, it, it was really nice to have sort of protected time to just focus on, you know, particularly doing a PhD. It, it, it's difficult to just do a little bit. Um, or certainly I found it difficult if I didn't have the majority of my week to concentrate on that. I find, you know, if I go away and come back, it takes a bit of time to get re-immersed in it. Um, so I think it was nice to have some protected time to do that. The thing I found is, you know, I'm really enjoying being back in clinical training. Um, didn't realise just how much I, I missed it. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, I think it's nice to, to strike a balance. Um, and you know there will be times in your career where one has to take the priority over another. Um, so you know, there'll be times where actually you probably just need to focus on your clinical training, and you know when you've got postgraduate assessments or um, you know undergrad exams coming up, you know you, that probably needs to take the priority. And equally, there might be times where you think actually I've got you know I've got the, the opportunity to take some time for you know to do something like a teaching fellowship or or a master's or a PhD or, or mm. you know, do some medical education research on the side. Um, I think it's nice having the balance. Um, yeah. It, it is, it's quite, it, you know, it's e equally, it's quite challenging um, trying to balance multiple things as I'm sure Alan finds. <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course it's hard. I mean, I, I know I'm smiling a lot and saying, "Yeah, it's great," but but of course <laughs> it, it's it's not always perfect. Um, but I think that that's one of the uh, downsides of having a, a portfolio career where you've got lots of people who, um, uh, lots of uh, bosses to to, to uh, that you have to be to to, to take account of. So uh, when I was uh, uh, in my last post, when I was the uh, t teaching dean, um, I'm quite sure that sometimes the NHS were wondering what on earth I was doing. I wasn't in the department looking at uh, x-ray scans. And meantime, when I was doing the x-ray scans, perhaps some people in the university felt, well, well why isn't he here um, helping us with this really tricky assessment issue? Um, but then, but the other side of it is you, have, you can have lots of really interesting conversations and connect people um, and make things just make the whole system run a bit more smoothly smoothly so um it, it's not perfect and uh, there is a downside to it in that um, you get pulled in lots of different directions but but the prize i think is to have a career where all every day there'll be a situation that you've that you've never come across before and, and so whether it's making a difference to an individual student who's um got really challenging uh, um, problems or whether it's trying to influence the the shape of um, postgraduate education um I, I think there's lots of opportunities to to, to get involved um and uh uh, the great thing about education as well is that you don't need to, um, you can get involved at, at any level. So there's one question I see on the chat is how can FYs get involved in med ed without undertaking an AFP? Well, my immediate answer is well, just volunteer to get involved in some teaching when you've got medical students on the ward and then offer to get involved in evaluation. Lots of little footsteps you can take to start with. And then once you start doing that, then it's much easier to make the next perhaps larger step. Mm. The thing, to, following on from Alan's comment there about getting involved, um, the thing I would suggest is just reaching out to people. Um, you know, if, if, you don't, if, if you don't let it know, let it be known that you are interested in getting involved, people won't necessarily come up and ask you. 
So, you know, if you think that, you know, if, the, if you see someone who's doing research that's, that interests you and you'd like to get involved, email and ask. The worst that can happen is they can say no. If you, you know, if you're working as a foundation doctor and you want to get involved in teaching, just email the medical school and say, you know, I would love to get involved in any teaching if there are any opportunities and I'm sure they'll bite your hand off. I think something like that can be really difficult to do when you're very junior and you don't have the confidence. Um, Abby, I don't know if you've had any experiences of, of this. Have you got any advice for like students or uh, junior clinicians for how to get over that sort of first hurdle and dipping, dipping a toe into the world of medical education? I think um, there is a comment about not having a med ed in cacao, which is what we are here. And it's just kind of make an opportunity. So I have three passions and one of them was overcoming neurofear. So I worked with the Neuroscience Society and we did education through that way. Um, and then just start picking things that are more interesting to you. So social media was another interest. And although I did get to do my original project, thanks to COVID, um, <laughs> I kind of mangled it so I was still in the same area so I've done a research on social media and education and it's just find what ignites the fire underneath you and then mm. you'll be more tempted to put that on top of what you've already got going on um, rather than trying to force yourself to do something that you're not passionate about for the simple sake of having it on your CV so it's just if you see an opportunity or if there are no opportunities make one. Sometimes um people sort of get into medical education for uh, perhaps the wrong reasons and they don't they don't uh, they focus more on sort of padding out their portfolios with uh, things to do um, as opposed to actually um, uh, sort of wanting to get into it for, for the teaching part or for uh, writing assessments or you know the, the truly nitty-gritty um, stuff so yeah I think um, sort of actually experiencing it um, and uh, getting it as involved as possible um, as early as possible is really really great way of um, actually finding out if it if it truly is um, for you um, on the sort of topic of um, portfolios um, have you has anyone here sort of had any experience with uh, electronic portfolios like uh, Horus or um, the NHSE portfolio before that? Um, and if you have, do you think they're sort of good tools for keeping track of what you're doing? I tend to find that, so most of the, so the portfolios that I've used with the foundation one and now the GP portfolio, um, and both of those, you know, you could put reflections in on teaching that you had done. Um, and certainly for foundation, you had to have an observed teaching encounter. I think, you know, ultimately, even if you're doing an AFP or an ACF in medical education, those portfolios are aimed predominantly at your clinical training. So I think they're probably not, or certainly I, I didn't find that they were particularly useful for adding educational stuff into. Um, I think it's really useful to keep a track of what you've done in, in education um, and, you know, trying to keep an up to date, either, either just like a you know, notebook or, or CV um, is useful because certainly when, um, when, you know, when I was applying for, for the AFP, uh, my head of school gave me a mock interview um, and it, he had remembered more of what I'd done than, than I had done. Um, <laughs> So I think just trying to remember, you know, everything that you've done and trying to keep track of it is useful. Um, you know, if you've got those resources, there's no harm in putting them on on the electronic portfolio. But I think certainly from my experience, I didn't feel like they were very tailored towards that. Um, I don't know if Alan has a different perspective being on the other side of uh, the postgraduate portfolio. Yeah, I, I agree, Elliot. I think the the portfolios are, are, are tend to be focused on clinical competencies um, rather than um, other um, areas of activity. I think what it what it can be helpful to do, is, as I think you said, is to try to record in in a format that's helpful to you. Um, the activity that you do and and perhaps um, record that against some kind of framework so that when people say well 
if you're asked in an interview, well, uh, what's your knowledge about assessment, then you can it can reel off because you, you've already organized it in, in that list. Um, so I've mentioned the um, Academy of Medical Educators before. I've got a conflict of interest because I'm involved in the Academy, but uh, uh, what you might want to do is have a look at the uh, website for that because they've got a framework for a professional standards framework that under various different categories, and that might be able to show you the kind of type of activity that you might that, that you might think about doing at each level of your career progression so that if you're, if you're quite heavy if, if you're doing lots of assessment work but not so much in assessment and feedback then it might give you a suggestion of or ideas of what kind of activity you might get involved with such that you've got a, a, a well-rounded portfolio of activity in medical education. Um, a couple of people in the comments have been talking about how difficult Horus is to use and compared to um, something called T-Log, which unfortunately closed down. Um, do you have any advice for people on find, who have been finding Horus difficult to use, how to make it work for them, or any other tools that would be better? Uh, I, I've never used Horus, so I'm, I'm not able to comment. I, I, I personally have used Horus, and I know how much of a nightmare it is. Um, my personal experience of it is that you just have to bite the bullet and you have to do your uh, dops and mini hexes and whatever. And um, separate to that, I, I personally keep a paper portfolio where I actually put the things that are more important uh, to me and my career sort of long term, um, as opposed to the short term that uh, Horus is very much focused towards. But yeah, sadly, I, I, I don't think there's a, a way around it. Um, you you just have to engage with it as best as possible. I agree that it would be useful, something like T-Log would be useful to have um, for recording um, teaching evaluations and things like that. There are some, there are some tools that are useful for more the education research side of things, so things like ORCID um, and ResearchGate are useful for recording um, publications and presentations and you know roles that you've had. Um, but yeah, having somewhere where you can consolidate um, teaching feedback, yeah, would, would be useful. Um, for someone who's only just started um, a med career or might not have a portfolio, what would you say is important for them to consider? Um, um, what, what goes into a good portfolio for someone who wants um, a med career? What should you consider when starting one up? I think doing you know the the core stuff well is important. So doing teaching and evaluating teaching, getting feedback on that. If you can, try and get some observation of your teaching. Ask someone more experienced, um, who, someone whose opinion you value, to you know if they've got the opportunity to watch you teach and offer you feedback afterwards. That's really useful. Um, once you've started to develop a little bit that's the kind of thing that you can offer other peers um, and you learn a lot from observing other people's teaching, you know, and thinking not about the content as much, but, you know, about their teaching style and approach. Um, you know, that, that's something we used to do um, at Keel amongst the medical education society. And, you know, I think people on the receiving and the giving end learned a lot from that. Um, so that's, you know, getting your, your teaching um, skills, uh, sort of, or getting practice in those and feedback on those is really useful. And then as you get involved in that, you might start to think about areas that you find particularly interesting, you know, different approaches to teaching. So you might find simulation interesting, or, you know, you might find um, flipped classrooms interesting or, or, or whatever. And, you know, if you, do, you know, read around and if there is a, to a topic of interest, then starting to think about scholarly projects that you might want to get involved in. Um, what about things, well, without, I, I realise as, as ASME members, we um, do have a bit of a conflict of interest, but what about things like uh, medical education conferences for uh, mingling with people, showing off the work that you're doing? Are there, are there any that you'd highly rate? Um, obviously, obviously there's a bias here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, so I've been... Uh, my first ASME conference, as I said, is in 2012, and I've been every year 
until this year when when unfortunately um it was cancelled um and there's a reason i go every year um i do think it's really useful partly to see what's going on and what other people are doing and to learn things that you can apply to your teaching asme is a really nice community um you know the people that go to the asm a it's a lot of fun um b it's really interesting and c you get to meet people that are really friendly and supportive um and you know I, i've had lots of you know, things emerge out of discussions at, at asme conferences so for example i arranged my um elective uh, in vancouver as i mentioned earlier um through a discussion at the welcome reception on one of the ASME conferences um, and you know I've done done work with various people that I've met um, at ASME conferences that has been really nice and it's nice then going back and seeing the same because there, there's there's quite a lot of people that go every year and then there's quite a lot of people that just sort of go once to to show off a project and then you know you might not see for a few years so it's nice to meet new faces but also to see uh, you know recognizable faces what do you think Alan? Uh, yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I think you said at the start, Elliot, you need to do the core well, and I absolutely agree with that. And for me, I think that the core, um, if you're medically qualified or clinically qualified, is your clinical skills. So do not compromise on, on them um, because uh, th that is absolutely cr uh, critical in your early career development. Um, I think offering to teach is, is really important, uh, and both informally perhaps, um, and once you've uh, uh, done that with uh, learners around you, because there are always learners around you, um, then maybe offer, then offer to teach more formally within, for example, the medical school. Uh, offer to examine as well, um, again, informally and then formally as well. There's huge numbers of medical students coming through the system, and in my last job, we really struggled sometimes to get enough examiners for some, for some exams. So, um, uh, we uh, were always very keen to hear from uh, junior doctors um, who were uh, available uh, and uh, to, to examine. I think going to medical education conferences, really important as well. Um, uh, the first med ed conference, the ASME conference I went to, I think was in 2005. Um, and uh, then I went to one in 2006. And at both these times, I was, my eyes were really open to the possibility and, and the people, uh, and also um, it gave me confidence that actually some of the stuff I was doing was actually okay and was perhaps even maybe a little bit better than some of the stuff that other people were talking about. So, uh, and then actually, as you say, Elliot, meeting people and having these conversations with um, people who you perhaps you've just seen their names written down, but actually to see them in the flesh and having that conversation, um, that kind of validated me as someone who, uh, that, that I felt I was in the right place um, in that kind of community. Um, yes, you can go to ASME conferences, but, but don't neglect the more local events that you have as well. Um, so uh, many trusts uh, or, or, or areas will have um, uh, local med medical education conferences where you can present things, even, even in, in de uh, departments as well. And then there might be regional as well as the national things. I, I guess the, the, the slight disadvantage about the, the bigger set piece conferences like uh, uh, Amy um, and Asmi and Aomi is that they, they cost a bit more money even in these uh, socially distanced uh, times mm -hmm. so um, but having said that if it's worth um, doing then uh, and you're really keen on it then perhaps you, you need to invest a bit of your time and perhaps money in in, in these things as well. Yeah. Oh, no, I think that's really really good advice I still think one of the best sort of medical education conferences that uh, I went to was just a, a small regional one where I actually got to see uh, a lot of what the clinical teaching fellows were up to and it was it was even on that sort of small local scale it was very uh, it was just such a lovely experience um, and it, it was completely free to go to as well so um, if, if you haven't explored that already uh, please please do um, we've had a question um, submitted about getting published as another way of showing off the hard work that you're uh, doing. Um, Elliot, do you do you have any advice on uh, you know that or that age-old question of how to get published? I guess. Um, yeah. So I think this is actually one of my. Um, 
potentially one of my regrets in, in some senses is um, not, you know, the things that I did early on, not realizing that actually with a, you know, with 10% extra work, I probably could have um, published that. And, you know, when you see similar things a year or two later being published, you're like, oh, actually, you know, I, I should have been more confident and should have just submitted something. And what's the worst that can happen? They can say no. Um, it's, I think if you are looking to publish, it's worth reading the journals and it's worth reading some of the journals, um, just looking around the types of articles that they publish, even before you start doing your project to, to have an idea of, you know, what do I need to do to, to get this published? Um, if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to be doing research, um, then I think it's worth trying to, if it's your first time, it's worth trying to reach out to people um, either locally or, or with similar topic interests that you're aware of to try and you know work together on that. Um, if you're looking to do sort of scholarship around educational innovation you've done, um, then yeah, trying to find the, the, the types of journals that publish those and, and read um, example articles. Um, and yeah, I think again, you know, lots of medical educators are friendly and supportive. Um, you know, I would typically, before I submit any paper, I would usually ask someone that hasn't been involved if they could just cast an eye over it and make sure you know I haven't completely missed something out um, or you know haven't explained something very well. And just you know, if it's your first paper, then asking a critical friend that you might have um, or a supervisor. Yeah, yeah I, I would. Uh, I agree with uh, what Elliot said. I think it's really difficult um, getting published for, for the first time. And looking back to my first article, I got published back in two thousand and, and something, two thousand three four. Uh, it, it would not have been published now because I think the whole standard has, has gone up considerably. So, um, and I've had plenty more papers rejected than I've had accepted. So my advice would be, if you're particularly if you're starting out, to um, to find someone that has published stuff, and then uh, help them uh, and say, can I do some data analysis? Uh, uh, because that will give you uh, um, that uh, edge uh, and experience. Because some of the medical education journals are really difficult to get published in now. I mean, um, um, uh, I think I, I see some nods and. I'm not going to name what they are, but I think, we, but, 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 but there are, it, it's not easy, but, um, but the, the, the upside is that there's lots of different ways that you can demonstrate and, and show scholarship. So don't think that if just because you haven't had a, a highly cited, a highly cited article published in medical education, that, 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 you, that you're a failure, that is not the case. There are lots of ways you can evidence scholarship and, and teaching and can still um, advance uh, in your career. That's, that's really motivating. Thank you. Um, Elliot, you, you've touched on your regret about not uh, submitting stuff for publication um, a bit earlier. Uh, on the topic of regrets, I think we've painted medical education as uh, this absolutely wonderful thing, which it is. Um, but has anyone, uh, does anyone want to offer any uh, regrets they have about their uh, involvement in medical education so far or anything that you really don't like about uh, medical education as a career? So um, one of the uh, big advantages, but also a slight disadvantage of medical education is the number of opportunities that are out there. So um, one of my regrets was saying yes to too many things at once. Um, so it's important um, with anything really is that you don't take on too much. Um, you don't burn out, but also you focus on a couple of things. You do them really well. And that becomes something that's both very um, beneficial for you um, and motivational in that you've um, seen this um, fantastic initiative through mm. um, but it also becomes something that's quite good for your portfolio rather than saying I've done five different things um, but they all fizzled out after I left you can say I've done this one fantastic initiative it stood the test of time it's sustainable innovative 
and um, this shows that I am passionate about MedEd and that I understand the needs. I yeah. think I completely agree with that. Right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, doing so, you know doing one thing well and doing small things well rather than trying to you know cure medical education in your first project. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that does resonate with me as well. I think we're all sometimes guilty of taking on a bit too much and then uh, ending up with a subpar uh, outcome at the end of it. And it, it's difficult because, you know, it's all stuff that's interesting and sort of stuff that's fun. But yeah, as I, you know, I guess, as I said at the start as well, you, sometimes you do have to prioritise and that's challenging. But, you know, it's worth, as Ryan said, doing fewer things well than half-assing a bunch of things. Alan, are there any difficulties at the sort of top end of the career? Oh, you're very kind. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I spend a lot of my time having that bit of that uh, imposter syndrome, thinking, uh, am I really doing what I should be doing? Um, uh, so, but in a sense, I think that's, uh, I hope that's a positive thing because it's really uh, important not to lose track of why we are, why we do what we do. And it, and it is all about, the learners, it's about patient safety, it's about making things a bit better. Um, my regrets, since everyone else is sharing, um, I do regret not having done a PhD. Um, I think, uh, and every few years, uh, I try to carve out a bit of time where I can do a doctorate or something, but I just, uh, for lots of reasons, it's been, it's been challenging. Um, I, I guess I regret not doing as much frontline teaching now as I did um, 10 years ago. Um, but that is the nature of the beast at the, um, well, it's not a beast, that's the nature of the role that I currently have. And it's balanced by the, the knowledge that I, I can influence um, education at, a, uh, at a, a macro level. Um, uh, although I would still don't lose track of, of the value and importance of influencing that, that individual in front of you. Um, but, but all in all, um, no job's perfect uh, and no career's perfect. But uh, I, 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 yes, although I've got some regrets, um, they're far, far more positives than negatives. That's, yeah, that's great to hear. That's what we all wanted to hear. So thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I think we've got time for a few more questions. Um, one we've had um, is about people who are considering a career in medical education, but they're not actually doctors. So um, has anyone got any advice for uh, non-doctors for how to get into uh, medical education? Yeah, Alan. Well, I think ASME is a great home and uh, and hub for for people like that, and um, uh, and I've got some really good friends who are uh, non medically qualified but have risen really to the top of their game. Um, one of the previous uh, very senior officers in ASME, uh, Jen Clellan, she's now um, holds a very senior role uh, over in the, on the other side of the world in medical education. So absolutely, th th there's a space uh, and a place for. Uh, for, for clinical educators um, um, because uh, uh, and again a lot of the principles for medical education absolutely apply to uh, to uh, people with other backgrounds um, I know that for example the, the physiological society they've got a really active uh, education group so for every single discipline that exists there will be um, uh, a community of uh, educators um, uh, but my advice has always been to anyone involved in education is don't just look within your own, own silo, always look across to what's happening on the other side of the education fence. So some of the best work I, I did earlier on was um, not with uh, just with med uh, medical education, but it was with some pharmacy educators at, a, at another university because that was really transformational in my thinking. So um, uh, absolutely, uh, th th there's, uh, if you're interested, there's a space and a place for everyone interested in education. And um, I think sometimes medical education becomes uh, synonymous with teaching. Um, what about for uh, those among us who maybe don't like teaching or don't really want to get involved with too much teaching? Is there still a place uh, for, for us? Um, my view would be yes. Uh, it, it's a measured yes, because I think you have to... Uh, uh, be have an enthusiasm for the discipline you have to have enthusiasm for the learners and um, I think if you're going to be credible um, you need to uh, 
uh, have some contact time and some actual uh, teaching uh, uh, e-teaching time because otherwise, uh, otherwise get the things get perhaps a little bit harder although there are some people that just like the face-to-face uh, -face teaching and they don't really like the assessment and that's fine other people that really like the assessment the psychometrics and are less keen on the face-to-face -face teaching but i think it's good to have uh, certainly a, a more a more um, a less experienced then good to have experience in all all facets of education and then you can perhaps have a bit of focus um, and, uh, and, uh, and special interest uh, as you progress. Brilliant thank you um, in the interest of time uh, I'm going to start wrapping things up I'm sorry if we didn't have time to answer um, your specific questions we will be looking uh, through them as Ryan said at the beginning and uh, trying to answer them um, just with written answers. Um, has uh, I'd like to go through everyone and sort of get uh, get your parting words of wisdom um, to all the people who've given up their time to uh, attend um, attend the session today. So, uh, Ryan, is it okay if we start with you? Yep. So whilst I said previously that it's good to prioritise your efforts, so try not to do too many things at once, one of the most useful questions that you can have in your arsenal that can open a lot of doors is how can I get involved? So if you see something that's um, quite interesting, um, then you can ask around, ask your medical school, ask your hospital, how can I get involved in this teaching method, um, this piece of research? And if there is um, a need that you've identified in your area, and the answer to how can I get involved is, well, I don't know, then you've found a, um, a gap that you could potentially fill with your own um, innovation. So MedEd is incredibly accessible to those who um, seek out opportunities. Thank you. Uh, Abby, is it okay if we move on to you? Yeah, uh, I think kind of just echoing what Ryan says, if you're at my stage and you can't see anything that you think you can get involved in, think about what you're passionate about, think about what's going to light the fire and what's going to encourage you to do more work on top of your degree already, stick your elbows out and just go for it. Brilliant, thank you. And Elliot? Um, I, I'm going to be boring and say a, a similar thing. Yeah, please <laughs> get, get in touch with people, reach out, um, you know, ask you know, what you can contribute, ask if there are any opportunities. The, the other thing I would say is try and, try and build on what you've done previously. It's much easier and you're, you're much more likely to be successful if you sort of build on, you know, if you do something small and then build on that um, and, you know, follow on sort of a, along the same theme and become, you know, a, a sort of mini expert in that, that niche than it is to be a jack of all bits. I mean, obviously it's interesting to do everything, but um, you know, that, that's a way to sort of build success quickly. Thank you. And last but not least, Alan, uh, crikey, it's all been said, um, but uh, be enthusiastic because if you don't enjoy, if you don't love what you're doing, then uh, you need to maybe uh, th think again. Uh, be creative, uh, connect with people, experiment. Um, what's the worst that could happen, you know? Um, and it's okay if you make mistakes. I've made loads of mistakes in my time. Um, but uh, if you like doing something, then just continue the, uh, that conversation and who knows where it'll take you. Thank you. So um, with that, I'd like to just thank everyone for um, first giving up your time to um, attend the session today. I hope it's been uh, useful. Um, and thank you also to uh, the panelists here who've uh, also given up their time and uh, answered, frankly, some quite difficult questions, especially uh, Alan, who sort of joined us on very, very short notice. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, a couple of post webinar notes. So, thank you, everyone. Um, as we said, um, all of the there are so many questions. We will 
uh, make sure to answer all of them and we'll uh, write a written response. Um, and a video of this session will be made available on the website um, asme.org.uk in a few days. Um, if you're interested in some more ASME Bite Size, then our next session will be on Wednesday, the 2nd of September at 4 p.m., where we'll be looking at well being and tolerance of ambiguity in times of COVID 19. So, um, three excellent uh, med ed researchers at the University of Exeter have been looking at well being and tolerance um, during COVID and looking at um, yeah, psychological well-being and exploring the relevance of their work in the light of the pandemic. So again, thank you everyone for coming. Some fantastic and insightful comments and questions and have a great evening.